So on behalf of the Academy of Entrepreneurs and Associates, let me welcome you this afternoon. Uh, we are recording this program, and if indeed it works out well, we'll be able to send you a recording of it in case you want to look at some of the slides or, or uh, do a uh, refresher on your own and uh, uh, review all the things we talk about today. <clears throat> I want you to know that I am not an attorney and I'm not an accountant. Uh, I'm not a CDA or licensed examiner. I'm just a fellow that's been in business for a long time and looks forward to helping you any way I can. Uh, I always mention to you that it's a good idea to get a second and third opinion on anybody's advice, including mine, and a good place to do it are the folks that are sponsoring our program this afternoon, which is the uh, Small Business Center at Nash Community College in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. The director there, Tara Norwood, is a wonderful lady. She does all she can to help entrepreneurs. So if you're in that area, give uh, Tara a call, set up an appointment. She has a, a, a vast array and library of, a, of a assets and a, a information that can help you. And plus she's got contacts all over the state that pretty much any question you might have, she'll be able to find the answer for you. If you're not in the Rocky Mount area and would like for me to get, uh, let you know who the uh, Small Business Center director is in your area and maybe uh, get, get y'all uh, connect, uh, connected with each other, I'll be glad to do that. Just, just mention that on the chat board and I'll be glad to hook you up with the folks in your area. Uh, my story is I started when I was 12 years old in business with my dad when we started a tractor dealership in Dunn, North Carolina. Dunn is uh, 25 miles north of Fedville right here, over on Interstate 95, uh, 30 miles below Smithfield, about 60 miles below Rocky Mount, uh, 40 miles east of Garter and, and, uh, and Raleigh. So this is where I'm talking to you from today. I've been in business uh, except for the four years I was in the U.S. Coast Guard back in the uh, 60s uh, and 70s, uh, where I served on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. I uh, actually uh, ran one of these 44-foot uh, search and rescue boats. Uh, that was my job at, at, in the military service. So a so salute to all of you who are who are veterans. Uh, we're very thankful for your service. I know we have Daniel on board with us today. Daniel, thank you for all that you do, and uh, and God bless you and your family. When we owned an equipment dealership for 52 years in Dunn, it was on the south side of Dunn. This building is still here. I've sold the property at this point, but that's what it looked like when we were a tractor dealership. And so through the years, I had the equipment business and kept it all that 50 years. And in the meantime, added uh, six or seven other businesses associated with it or profit centers. Uh, back in 2008, I was able to sell the business, created the new corporation called Fast Forward Services, and I uh, started doing this type of training. Wrote, wrote, a, few, wrote a few books, and, uh, and along with some other uh, 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 enterprises that I've started. So, been a pretty busy fellow, and I certainly look forward to sharing uh, anything I can help you with on your journey. And I appreciate you being a part of mine. Uh, for now about 13 years, I've been working with the small business centers in the eastern and central and coastal, coastal part of North Carolina, traveling pretty much in all of these different counties, and uh, look forward to picking that back up. We'll start some new person-to-person -person, uh, seminars uh, in April for the first time since COVID came in, so I'm excited about doing that. Uh, this is what the home page of my website looks like. That's a, my primary income now. It comes from selling implements all over the United States, implements that go behind tractors, like mowers and discs and things like that. So I'm very active in business, have a huge customer base. Uh, and uh, in the seminars that I teach about how to uh, manage and run and grow your business, it, all, it includes lots of aspects of doing business on the Internet. Uh, if we were in a webinar today, this is what the old buzzard would look like. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> just if you had this picture in your uh, in your house, you probably wouldn't have as many insects for sure. Just just kicking around. Again, I'm not a lawyer or an accountant. Just here offering you free advice. 
So the Warrior Handouts is, third, is 40 street smart drill skills. And what this is is 40 different little techniques and strategies, uh, uh, business skills that if you'll read and you will adopt them, I'll guarantee you, you'll have a more successful business with less stress and more profit. It's just that simple. Uh, uh, 30 of these videos, you can go to uh, to YouTube and I'll present them individually. I'd suggest to you that you try to do one a day. Just just take one a day, watch it twice. It'll take you about two minutes on each one. Watch it twice, let it sink in, thinking about how it applies to you, and uh, and start owning these drill skills to just to give you a free shot in the arm of some really good techniques to help you run a smarter business. Talk about trucks, I do love the trucks, no doubt. Uh, this is my favorite one, which is a, a Power Wagon by Dodge. Uh, this is about a 1962 model here. <clears throat> and I fell in love with them because the Coast Guard stations on the beaches uh, had these big uh, Power Wagons so that we could actually pull our boat right out uh, on the beach uh, on its trailer back it right into the surf and and this this truck was strong enough and tall enough it would back right out into the surf and we could launch the boat uh, we didn't have to have an inlet or a dock to do it uh, i fell in love with this truck at that point in time we had had trucks at the equipment company when i was growing up but this was one that was more like fun to me than it was work so uh, Fast forward about 50 years, I was at Kenley, North Carolina, on Interstate 95 at a huge truck stop over there. And I'd be darned if they didn't have one of these trucks pretty much just like this uh, inside the truck stop. So uh, I was able to uh, stand up and appreciate it again. So I want you to have your favorite truck so you can tell your children and grandchildren about them. Pretty much, now we had a few bigger trucks than this, but this is the truck that I spent most of my time driving, which was just a a, 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 a ten wheel. Uh, well, this is a six six wheeler. We had ten wheelers too. Rollback bodies. Uh, our primary delivery trucks at the equipment company. We've had a lot of folks come through these webinars now in the last two years, and some of them are doing real well. I want to highlight talking about Crystal Fuller who is well on her way to getting her CDL. She's, a matter of fact, she's got her CDL and she's uh, doing her practice training now. So very proud of Crystal. It won't be long before she'll be not only driving, but hopefully having her own brokerage business. I'm looking forward to having each and every one of y'all's picture up here when you're doing that as well. Uh, Ray from Wales down in Clinton has, uh, has had his CDL, CDLs for years and years and years. Uh, drove for a huge company. I uh, got hurt. They laid him off, so he started driving his own trucks and uh, doing quite well in his own towing business. Footnote, Rayford also does horse training, so uh, well, I'll talk a lot this afternoon about it. Try to, try to have as many options as you can. This is Shirley Gray from Fayetteville, North Carolina. She has uh, been a driver for quite a while. She's got her, her brokerage bit business uh, up and running now. Uh, she spends probably 75% of her time doing long hauls uh, and runs her broker business from the uh, from the truck. So congratulations to her. I want to tell you that, uh, about Valerie Smith. Uh, she's a graduate of our uh, academy. As a matter of fact, she's a master's graduate. It means she's uh, attended several of them and graduated. She has started her own transportation business where she has a wheelchair accessible van and she has a uh, starting now to have a full-fledged business in Wilmington. Her bookings are excellent. Started right here on this program. So there's a lot of different directions you can go in when you're thinking about being in trucking and transportation. Uh, what what we want to do here is just to kind of give you a, a view from 25 or 30,000 feet on all the aspects, all the different things that you might want to consider as you're getting your thoughts lined up to move into the trucking industry for one since you want to go. If it's your first time on board giving you this thing, and I want to tell you that some things will apply to you, whether you have uh, one van and you're moving people around, or whether you've got 15 dump trucks in a major uh, uh, transport operation with dump trucks. This information that we're going to share this afternoon Hopefully, we'll be keeping you on the right path all the way through. 
So as I mentioned earlier, I want to say to you officially that uh, we do have available to you at no charge three, that's three each, one, two, three, uh, practice tests for CDL license in North Carolina. One of them actually came from the Department of Transportation and two others, uh, uh, Crystal, who I mentioned earlier, uh, found them and just shared them with us. But we've got them in a form now that we can email you these PowerPoint programs and you can practice them over and over and over as many times as you'd want. Uh, while it took us a little bit of effort and investment to make them together, uh, we're offering them to you absolutely free and hope that it helps you and you're welcome to share them with other people if you'd like. So that's a free, free practice test with the answers uh, on the CDL license for North Carolina. If you'd like a copy of these, just put it in, uh, in chat to send it to you, and I will. The files are so large, I'll send them to you via what they call Google Drive. That's one of the apps that you can download free of charge uh, from, from the uh, Google, Google Chrome for sure. <clears throat> in your handout, uh, which is a pretty extensive handout, it, which is based on the book I wrote about uh, starting your own trucking business. Uh, but whatever type of business you're going to start, there are a number of things that you may need to do on your checklist. So in uh, having person-to-person -person interviews with folks getting in, into the business, I developed a list of uh, 15 or more things that we need to check off. They may or may not apply to you, depending on the type of business that you're going to have. But most of the time they will if you're if you going to be in a big rig type truck. So hold on to this checklist, go down it, see what applies to you. Being in the trucking business is a risky business. It's risky for a number of factors. And while some folks just might tell you there's no risk involved hardly at all, then we got to correct that. You may be the best truck driver ever been born on the road uh, and, and know everything there is to know about the trucks and the driving and the trailers and handling the freight. But my business, uh, the, the part of actually running a business, uh, you may be very weak on. So that's the reason that uh, you want to pay close attention here. Because if you own your own business, not only do you need to know all about the trucks, you need to know quite a bit about how to run a business. So what is the very best risk management tool for your business? What tool can you put into place? What thing can you do to help protect your business in the long haul? Because what is your greatest risk uh, if you own your own trucking company April 4th, 2022? What is the risk that might charge, cause you the most problems? Well, especially now after COVID, I can say it's a very high risk, of course, Hopefully that's going down. Not, not, not too many people are involved in that. Uh, but generally, if you own your own trucking company, the biggest risk you're going to face is your own health, uh, the safety, an injury at home, an injury on the job. They, an independent trucker has to stay healthy because if you can't, if you can't make the truck roll, then I, there's no doubt that uh, your business is going to suffer. We've got several more people that's joined us. I'd like to say welcome, especially Renee. I'm so glad to see you back with us. Uh, Renee is a, uh, a, a, a getting started in the trucking business. has been a great help for me, and I hope I sent her some good information as well. So good to have you on board with us, Renee. I'd say healthy. Now, this is the 50s or through the 80s when being in the trucking business, it was always hard work. But if you basically stayed out of trouble, all would be okay because during those times, most people worked for hard, for large companies, uh, maybe even had a Teamsters Union job. Uh, and those had great pension plans and they'd pay legal support and pretty much no worries at all with trucking expenses. All you had to do was be a good driver and get along well with, with your customers. Things went well. But you know what? Those days are behind us. Uh, it, it's not the same game anymore. It's kind of a, a lot more pressure for the independent owner. Very few truckers now uh, have unions, uh, have union jobs to help them with their pension plans and insurance and things like that. So there's a, a lot more to deal with in owning your own business uh, than there used to be. 
But I can tell you it's pretty much an uphill battle, especially if you get hurt on the job with a large company. So yes, go ahead and get your CDL, and maybe you can get right on board with a large company, drive somebody else's truck, and everything will be fine because they're paying real good wages now generally, lots of benefits. But here's the bugaboo. If indeed you get hurt, you're going to have an uphill job to get any type of support with assistance, uh, uh, workman's compensation, or benefits. It's almost like they really don't, don't want you to take advantage of the benefits. So, and, and if you are uh, just uh, hurt a little bit and you could do some other work like in an, a light duty task, very few of the big companies are making light duty tasks available for injured workers. So stay healthy. But you got to be wise. Sometimes things just happen. And so I don't say stay healthy but have a plan B. Yeah, it's fine to be working for the big company, but I want you to have a plan B and a good reason to be here today so that if you have to, you can start your own business. Why am I saying that? Because during the last four years, and one of the reasons we do this webinar at all is because so many people have come to us and say, look, I've been driving for years, but something has happened at my work. I've lost my job. They laid me off for one reason or another. I want to start my own business. So people that's very qualified and very experienced still have to start their own trucking business sometime and learn a lot about what we're talking about here today. So having a plan B and a plan C is big, big risk management factors, and I'm encouraging you to do that. In other words, let's have a few more knowledges, uh, uh, more knowledge about having a business plan to get started. Why is the trucking business a tricky business now? Well, mainly because as the economy goes up and down, and right now it's on an up series, and as far as trucking goes, it's on a big upswing uh, because we've got inflation, we've got the shortage of supplies. People are depending on trying to get more and more and more and need more and more truck drivers to make it happen. And so many of the baby boomer generation, that's fellas my age in the 60s to 80s, are retiring, <clears throat> leaving all kinds of vacancies in, in the market. So there's a lot of opportunities for, for folks to get started with trucking. But there's more opportunities now because the economy is good. When the economy slows down, and it will because economies always go up and down, when we get into a slowdown on the economy, I want to tell you right now that the small, independent, new trucking company will be the first ones to suffer. I didn't say suffer. I said suffer, as if, as if get in trouble. Why is that? Because all the bigger companies, when the going gets tough, they'll start cutting their prices and doing all they can to suck up all the business from the small companies. That will mean There'll be a lot of folks who were doing just fine when the economy was booming, but when it started slowing down, they start getting in trouble. And that's why I want you to pay attention about having a plan B and a plan C, because those folks who don't have something else they can do or have a, a wider base of customers, then they'll be the first ones to get in trouble when the economy starts softening. Fuel prices make it a risky business as well. You and I both know that recently as prices have gone from the $3 range up to the 4 and $5 range, the cost of running a truck on the road, which is basically fuel and tires and labor, really has soared. So uh, as, chicken, as, uh, as fuel prices go real high, that chicken salad is going to turn into chicken something else if you don't have some protections uh, in place. So. Again, that's the reason it's a risky business. Regulations are always changing. They're necessary, but they also, sometimes the regulations may change and catch you by surprise. Uh, maybe you'll have an uh, occasion to be fined or get in trouble because of it. So because you have to stay on top of so many regulations, it makes it kind of a risk business. Accidents accident when those two wheels are turning there's a chance there's a wreck and we all know that when you got a big truck there's no such thing as a small wreck so that accidents make it a risky business for all of us so 
what can we do to keep all these risks that I've been warning you about from killing your business, from making you go broke, from giving you a bad day at the park? Okay? There, the good news is for every risk, there's a risk management tool or a risk management strategy that will help you get through tough times. One is make sure you've got good insurance in place. And having good insurance is very, very important. Next is <clears throat> be safe. Have safety programs. Do all you can to avoid injuries to yourself and to your equipment and to your employees. Lastly, have a good relationship with the right broker and have good employees that helps help you stay on top of regulations. These three factors can do a lot towards protecting you from real bad days. <clears throat> Diversity is the key factor to staying uh, alive in business. Excuse me. If you're doing one thing for one customer, I'll guarantee you it will go soft one day. Uh, it'll go south and your business will die up. So you want to stay diversified as much as you can. Choose a type of business or several types of businesses so that you can serve a variety of different customers. Smaller operators can protect themselves quite well, provided you have a, a, a several niche markets that you're working in. In other words, you're doing things that other people aren't doing, and you have picked out the niche markets that stay steady, whether the, the economy is good or not so good. Also, diversity in the way that you do your business in if, there's, if it's available to you to buy and sell products that you're hauling, in other words, that you're hauling products and people are paying you to haul them, but also maybe you're bringing products back or you're hauling products that you're going to sell retail or wholesale <clears throat> and therefore be able to make two levels of profit on the same truckloads. Very, very uh, interested in doing that. I, I like to call that to be able to what I call uh, uh, stacking your profits by the ways that you plan your business. A lot of us now are using the term side hustle. It's kind of new to me, but I, I kind of like it because especially in the business that we're doing here, building side businesses without adding to your expenses to make extra money and without having to quit your day job that's how, I, that's how I describe a side hustle, bringing in extra income without increasing your uh, general overhead. In trucking and transportation, that is a huge factor that a lot of people do it. So let's just take a look here for a minute at this slide. I uh, gave you some ideas of the different types of diversity that you might be considering. Hot shot trucking is the hottest thing going on now. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Buying and selling used trucks and trailers or, or repairing them. Getting involved in camper relocations. Transporting these uh, uh, travel homes from one, one point to another. Hauling boats. Towing of all different types. Having car haulers and horse trailers. Actually getting involved in insurance sales yourself. Yes, go ahead and get your driver's license. Also go ahead and get your insurance license. There's no reason to say that you can't be driving a truck and at the same time selling insurance. Uh, with the Internet now, there's a lot of possibilities. I know several fellows that have set up their own truck washing businesses. Uh, they have uh, set up the, the big sheds with, with uh, sheds that you drive through and have uh, sprayers all around. Uh, they have different techniques of detailing trucks and such as that. So they may spend their week on the road uh, uh, driving the trucks, but a couple of days they get home or the weekends have some people helping them, have a side business washing trucks. Not theirs, but other folks that are lined up to do it. When you get into business, you'll learn that a lot of folks will have their trucks cleaned every week, rain or shine, and usually if they uh, find someone that they like the job they're doing, they'll carry them to them every time. <clears throat> How about giving some tours, signage working, 
detail in the storage. Uh, more and more independents now are, are going to be owning their own trucks and need a place to park them and store them or service them or wash them. So some folks are getting involved in actually buying real estate and setting it up as the truck parking lots for independent truckers. It's amazing how many different options that you might have. Each option is, gives you the ability to make some more money or take some of the stress off of you. Uh, if times get a little tough, it can go a long, long way. Your business is going to be basically serving two purposes. Trucking business is all about bidding on a job. That is making an offer, negotiating it, and, and, and being awarded the job, the bids. Or number two, fulfilling the bid after you get it. So if you get the bid, you got to make it happen. So the, the uh, monkey's on your back for the transportation, for the accounting, to get the contracts done, for all of that. But the key is there's two sides of the business, getting the business to begin with and then making it happen. So we'll kind of look at those two different sides. What's a real bad thing in a trucking business? It's just sitting still. A truck that's sitting still, the trucks are dry rotting. I mean, the tires are dry rotting. Nothing's happened. We're not making any money. What's a real bad thing? It's when you're traveling with an empty truck and are not getting paid. So you talk about the two risks that, that, uh, that will eat you alive in this business. That's the first two. What's a good thing? It's traveling with cargo and getting paid to do it. You know, those th things are just simple. You know, say, so, well, heck, Steve, what's new about that? Not a thing. But keeping an idea, keeping an eye on the foundation facts are always what we need to do in any small business because it's easy to it's easy to lose attention. So everything we're going to be doing in our business plan and and uh, and and working towards getting started is going to be how to have less uh, driving without getting paid and more uh, driving all the time, uh, hauling cargo and getting paid well for it. Why are there so many regulations? And does it make you mad that there are so many? Well, it shouldn't make you mad. I want you to tell you we got to have them because trucking is a part of our national defense and our national commerce. This country cannot get along without you. It cannot get along without a, a lot of truck drivers and really a lot of independent truck drivers are more healthy for the country than just a few large companies. So we got to have a way to have our freight, our bread and butter and bullets and biscuits. We got to have a way to get them moving across the country to the ports, back and forth, easily and quickly. And to make that happen, lots of times means we need a lot of regulations. We need a lot of regulations just to protect the small independent truckers. As I mentioned earlier, if, if we didn't have regulations in place, just a few, one or two or three trucking companies would do all the freight and uh, cut out all the uh, opportunities for us to have independent businesses like you guys want to run. Anytime there's a truck wreck, it's a big one, and therefore we need regulations and rules to protect uh, the, the, the public and the property. Uh, highway maintenance. Uh, trucks are... are uh, the main reason uh, the DOT people tell me that probably as much as 90% of all maintenance on, on roads uh, are caused by heavy loads, heavy trucks that are moving up and down. So the regulations have to be stipulated on, on uh, weight limits and height limits and things like that just to protect our infrastructure. So what type of business do you want to have? Uh, we're going to talk about a, a lot this afternoon, and it's important that you go ahead now and say, you know, I, I think I'm going to try to uh, decide on what business I could have and have five profit centers in it, five different things that I could do, five different customer groups that I might serve with my trucking uh, rigs. So before you jump into it, uh, and because the competition is so steep, 
uh, I want to encourage you to do some thorough researching. I mean, look at it deeply. Talk to some people that are doing the different types of trucking before you make a decision. Don't jump in until you've done your homework. Right here within a mile of my home in Dunn is Rooms to Go Warehouse on Interstate 95, over a million square feet under one building. It's a huge place. So if you're traveling north on three on 95, it's over on the right-hand side of the road. And they've got this truck parked out there all the time that says they need owners and operators. And I'm told by several folks that I've talked to that they're, they're reasonable in what they're paying folks to do. And if you like that style and they've got certain routes uh, that suit your particular needs or where you like to go, that you can probably do quite well just driving for rooms to go in your truck. In other words, you've got your own independent business but you've assigned one of your trucks to haul their stuff and see how it works out. I've had other drivers to tell me that it's, it's okay if you're going one way with their load, but to come in back empty or trying to find another load can be difficult. So you got to keep that in mind too. But there's a lot of opportunities for independent truck drivers with, that own your own vehicles to pull the people trailers. Or you don't be a sub or you don't have a business where you subcontract. Uh, your drivers. Uh, even though uh, you don't own the business and run it and negotiate and receive all the contracts, the actual uh, drivers and the trucks and the insurance they have on their individual trucks is going to be their business. In other words, you're going to ha have a group of contractors that, uh, that uh, work for you and then you'll have a group of customers that you line up to work, so you're running pretty much a, a trucking company uh, with it, or a brokerage company that you've got under the umbrella of your own trucking company. So that's one type of business that you can go with. The downside of that option is it gives you a lot less control over the drivers and how uh, that cuts into your profits from one way or the other. But you don't, you, again, here in this, the drivers, you're contracting them rather than having them on as employees. Now, a privately owned driver's company is that you or other people that you hire to drive your equipment give you a lot of options, a lot more control and power over what's going on in the business. But it also means it's up to you to keep those employees in, uh, on board. Make sure they're engaged with your business and you care about them. And it's your responsibility to keep up with the equipment, pay the expenses of the trucks, and go from there. Most small independent trucking companies are doing it this way. It's the husband and wife team or the husband and a brother or the husband, uh, they get started with one truck, then find a, a, another one, find a driver they feel good about, bring another one on board, and then grow from there. I've had personal experience with people who have started this way and have grown up to as many as 10 or 15 uh, trucks. Uh, it's quite easy to do if you've got a, a, a market that you can work with, some shippers that will stay with you, and you know uh, other people and, and have some experience of uh, hiring and firing employees. Because Let's say that you're working in the uh, fresh produce market in eastern North Carolina, basically out of Faison or Benson, hauling sweet potatoes or fresh, fresh vegetables, or over, over in the mountains hauling apples. <laughs> there is a lot of product that needs to be hauling, and if you've got a good, uh, a good reputation, you might have four or five trucks that you can keep busy all the time. Uh, I know several uh, companies that started here in Dunn, uh, eventually moved down to Florida, serving the vegetable industry, <clears throat> and now have bases in both places. Where are you going to go? How wide do you want your trips to be? I need some water. Some of us just don't want to leave home, and others say, you know, I'm all right as long as I can get home at night. I'm kind of that way, and given my webinars and seminars, uh, I try not to travel so far enough away that I can't get back at night, because that's where I like to be. 
But you know, in the trucking business, you, know, you might need to be going from coast to coast. And indeed, if uh, if you're in it to win it for the long term, and uh, you got a nice big truck, you got a debt that comes along with it with a payment, and maybe it's the lifestyle that you want. Start out in North Carolina today, and let's head for California, and try to line up some trips on the way back to end up back here. A lot of people are doing that. As a matter of fact, we've had several people come through the academy in the past year that they're doing the long hauls today, uh, either driving by themselves or with a partner or maybe even doing tag team driving for expedited loads. But it's a lifestyle that you need to kind of warm up to and maybe even try before you jump into it for yourself in some type of way. I'll take just a minute to welcome some other people that have come on board with us. Uh, and we're glad to have you back. Some folks that are very uh, interested and very good at the trucking business. I will mention to you that if you're brand new at it and you want to bring on board some folks that have administrative ex experience uh, and you contract them to help you get up and started, we've got several people that can do that. As a matter of fact, a couple of them are with us this afternoon. And I'll be glad to make those referrals to you. I uh, just mentioned it in chat. and. Maybe we can help several of you do some networking. But you need to think about and set up your uh, uh, business plan to include the type of uh, traveling you're going to be doing. It'll have a lot to do with the equipment that you buy, the insurances that you buy, uh, the way you set up your, uh, your, your general operating system. So local, uh, halfway across to the Mississippi, nationwide, load boards wherever they carry you, whatever your options are, just have a plan involved so you know where you're headed. Depending on what you're going to be doing, the loads you're going to be carrying, uh, how heavy your equipment is, you may need different endorsements for your CDL license. And there are quite a few of them, so I'm going to encourage you to read them, uh, talk to other people doing the same type of work that you want to do, see what the endorsements that you need are, and while you're doing these CDL tests, uh, find out what's, what do you need to do to qualify for the other endorsements. The type of freight you're going to be handling could be less than truckloads, LTLs, uh, full truckloads, air ride trucks for special uh, special handled items like computers or, or uh, real fragile items. Uh, some trucking companies, especially small independents, will focus on just hauling from the airports. In other words, I don't serve some, uh, certain airlines. And they indeed may provide you the tractor and the, tr the trailer, or uh, you have your own tr uh, tractor and just pull their trailer. So if you're close to a major airport and you're looking for a niche market that's really strong and, and really steady, then you might just want to talk to the air freight people out at the airport closest to you. And then there's expedited freight services. That is where a customer wants something picked up at one place and, and carried halfway across the country, but he wants it tomorrow. So that's the expedited freight services, which usually pay two or three times the amount that others do. And really what's needed to make that happen is a, is a tag team of drivers. So if you're going after that, that may just be something that suits you really well because the two drivers can make the same amount of money with one truck, therefore uh, a little bit. Uh, neither one of them has to uh, have to pay all the expenses, so you cut your expenses in half and be able to make a, uh, the same amount of uh, income uh, doing expedited type work. <clears throat> specialized hauling means specialized equipment. So some of these uh, different trucks that you're seeing here are very uh, interesting, uh, whether you're hauling uh, fisheries to the hatchery with a, a truck full of tanks full of baby fish or logs or the biggest watermelon in the whole world, no doubt, or the most popular type of trucking in the all the all the world. Easiest to get into, most stable is like up here in the left hand corner. That is like two men in a truck. Uh, that franchise was started years and years and years ago, uh, and whether you're working with a with a franchise or not, or whether you just developed your own two men and a half a truck or one and a half men in a truck, whatever you call it, uh, that is a good steady business uh, in eastern North Carolina or anywhere else. 
specialized hauling might include uh, like your hauling all the stuff that I deal in. Uh, if I was to get in a truckload of rotary cutters, it would come in on a freight truck that looks like this, a specialized trailer, a specialized uh, carriers. So, uh, but these are made to to do a certain job. And then maybe you don't do some hot shopping, hot shotting down like the one on the above below here, where you can uh, have a, a much less expensive hauling rig. But as long as you're staying at visits, your expenses are going to be down. Therefore, you have a better chance of that some profit. So if it's three men in the truck, or maybe you're doing overseas container transport, that is, you would basically have your own tractor and a special uh, trailer that's made to, to handle these overseas containers, like coming on container ships. We have a world, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of folks in our area that that's the only hauling that they do. They have learned to work the ports, uh, learn how that system works, and they do quite well with it. It could be maybe you want a wrecker or recovery type vehicle. As long as there's trucks and cars on the road, there's going to be business there for you. Lumber, livestock, agricultural products, and we're right in the heart of the peanuts and cotton and fertilizer and shavings, equine and swine, all different kinds of uh, agricultural situations that you can haul for. The lumber industry uh, for logs, lumber, and different forestry products and chips uh, is alive and well. So we are in an area where trucking is going to keep on going. Uh, some of the markets will get tight sometimes. Some uh, uh, will flourish and bloom at other times. But, you know, we hadn't lost any of them at all, so we're very fortunate in that, uh, in that area. And so depending on the location where you are that you might have contacts might help you decide on which type of business you want to go into. I want to encourage you to look towards the niche market. So those places where it's a specialized hauling, therefore you, if you have the specialized equipment, you'll get the business. Uh, different types of security businesses, boats, luxury cars, all require specialized hauling. And therefore you get people get locked in. Hazardous materials like they might have for the military, being explosives or firearms or things like that, uh, pays a premium in hauling costs. You have to have some specialized equipment and specialized hauling to, to do it, specialized training. So um, when you, anytime you can get specialized, that means you're going to make a little bit more money or maybe a lot more money for what you're doing. Folks that are out here like you that are on the road that have got your CDLs, you learned all that you need to know, you know about maintenance, the different vehicles, the different engines, then maybe you really are ready to think about hauling people around, such as in buses or family charters or things like that. You're 99% of the way there. Uh, if, if it's good to you, then maybe hauling people can make up a good sideline for your side hustle. Uh, to enhance your profitability. But as I said earlier, more and more folks now are looking at hot shotting. As the general cost of trucks have skyrocketed during the last three years, some people just have found it hard to make the investment to buy a big tractor trailer rig and instead are now looking at buying the small pickup truck type rigs with gooseneck trailers <clears throat> and doing hot shotting. Hot sh shotting. Uh, there's no doubt you can haul a lot of different kind of things and pull it with a pickup truck, whether it be plumbing and pipes or lumber or even some types of logging and used cars and new cars, all different kind of tractor and implement issues. In other words, if you can put it on an 18-wheeler, that means you can put it on a gooseneck trailer usually. So why is it becoming more popular? Because CDL licenses are not required. Lower startup cost, of course, and more flexibility. <clears throat> See, these a lot in eastern North Carolina folks moving tractors around. There's always some tractor dealer, always a farmer going that needs some repairs. Always folks going to tractor pools or maybe the different auctions. Hot shotting is very, very popular in our area and getting more so. Uh, 18 years ago, before I sold my businesses, uh, we were seeing about a third, a third of our uh, freight coming into us and going out by this type hauler 
versus 18 wheelers. Fewer restrictions <clears throat> and folks that are getting into this business are able to uh, take a jump step and, and step up stepping stones if they want to go larger because they're making contacts every day. Uh, small business owners uh, generally are able to do business easier with other small business owners, which gives you a, a good edge on uh, the big freight truck company trying to uh, nose into your territory if you've got a business relationship uh, as a hotshot trucker. I want to tell you about a resource I looked at. Uh, I didn't want to write another book about uh, trucking, but I did want some really special information on hotshot trucking because it's such a phenomenon right now. On Amazon.com, you can order this book by Colton Ryder. It focuses on on hotshot and got it right here on the desk somewhere under a pile of stuff. It focuses on do's and don'ts and all the uh, uh, ramifications of, of uh, getting started hot shotting. He, he, he writes in everyday ling language. It's easy to understand. So if hot shotting is your primary interest, I want to encourage to you that you that you order this book. I think it's about $16 on Amazon. Uh, and of course, I'd like for you to consider getting my book too. I go into more in depth about all different types of trucking as I do in this uh, uh, webinar. Now, in your handouts is also one that's talking about 50 businesses that you can start with $100 or less. And I'm not trying to talk you out of the trucking business because you darn sure can't try to start a trucking business with $100. But you'll get a lot of ideas in this handout of other items that you might be doing that will enhance your trucking or things that you might be doing that trucking will become a major player in, in, in getting that business up and running. It may give you a good insight into quite a few profit centers that you could do in addition to being a trucking company. There's a nice looking rig. Isn't that pretty? It's like a freight liner. I used to always love the beauty and the chrome on a lot of these trucks. It's all about the equipment. You can get the job done if you got the equipment to make it happen that you can operate legal and safe with it. So securing the right equipment is very important. This is a friend of mine who's bought this used trailer. It's a very nice trailer. He got it at a very good price. But you really got to be careful when you're buying stuff like this because in this particular trailer, uh, someone had done a really great job about putting plywood sides on it. had reinforced the, the sides in the back with, with plywood paneling to protect it from, uh, from getting damaged and such as that. It increased the weight of the trailer a little bit, but still it uh, enhanced its, uh, its, its value. However, after the person had bought this trailer, they learned when they went and picked up a load of materials that that uh, thickness of that plywood on each side made the trailer space inside a little bit too narrow to slide two pallets in beside of each other. Just that inch and a half made all the difference in the world. So when you're inspecting the used equipment or you're adding uh, equipment to your fleet, always be sure that it hadn't been modified in such a way that it may be messed up for something you're planning on hauling. Now, the person that bought this still is just fine because he or she's got a lot of other stuff they can haul in this trailer, and it got it at a very good buy because prices have been skyrocketing on trailers as well. Portable parking lots, uh, kind of a soft industry right now. You don't see as many of them out on the road uh, hauling new cars, mainly because uh, there's very few new cars being put on dealers' lots compared to what it usually is. So is that bad? No, because these truckers now have gone to use hauling used cars. And as the uh, even the car dealers that can't get the new equipment, they're doing all they can do to go to more sales and buy more used cars. And so hauling uh, uh, this uh, types of vehicles for one reason or another remains to be a very steady business. People hiring uh, folks to, to move folks around with uh, owning your own trolleys, owning your own people movers or buses, uh, good steady work now. 
you, know, you just have to make sure you're abiding by the regulations that are in place and have a, a steady customer group. You know all about fixing trucks and such as that, so some folks are looking at more rental equipment. As the cost of vacations go up on the coast, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and Florida, more and more families are looking to, to camping. Some are looking at renting camper homes from real expensive ones down to those that are inexpensive like this one. So there may be a market out there for you to kind of get into the vacation rental vehicle business. <clears throat> but getting that right equipment like Rayford deal with his uh, rollback uh, is very important. You want to get a truck that will serve the niche market well that you're going after, whether it be a, a 22 or a 28 footer, the different types of winches, the different types of towing devices that you have on the back of your trucks. I make all the difference in the world is whether or not it's fit for this. Miss Pollen has been working on me the last couple of weeks, and I apologize for my voice being scratchy. <clears throat> Now, we got to get it, we got to get ownership, we got to get a right to it. So I want to mention to you that maybe you don't have the money or the or the finances to go out and, and uh, pay cash for something or to get a long-term loan. And it's good for a business that's just getting started to always remember that you might be able to lease or rent to own the equipment that you need to get started. Maybe you can want to go in and buy your tractor, but you want to lease or rent trailers. I'll tell you that lots and lots of companies now prefer that you to do business with the operator owner with his tractor and let them furnish the trailers. Uh, trailer prices have gone really high in the last three years, and a lot of uh, uh, companies want the trailers to be set up a certain way so they can uh, they can pack them, they can ship, they can protect their products. Uh, their employees know how to load and unload them. So more and more companies want you to pull their trailers, and that's a good thing. Uh, even knowing that, that if you're having to deadhead with those trailers, most of those companies are allowing you to have free use of them uh, to uh, to pick up and move product on the way back uh, when you're deadheading, and that gives you an extra profit incentive. Also, you want to talk to owner operators that are going to be doing the same type of work that you're doing, just ask simple questions and they will give you good answers. You'll just be amazed at, at the truck stop, uh, uh, at your friends, uh, at the truck repair places. Uh, people are willing to help you and tell you things that can save you hundreds and thousands of dollars, but you need to ask the questions. Don't be ashamed to ask. When you are buying, be willing to negotiate. Uh, you, it's up to you to get the very best deal that's available out there. And I don't tell you as a dealer, uh, a person who has sold uh, large, expensive uh, whole goods before, we've always got negotiating room. So those people that come and just pay the first price that you put out there, they are really spending more money than they have to. Everybody wants to think, you know, you're, you're, you're a great deal maker and i got a great sale price on but even if they've got a great sale price on, they've still got room to negotiate. But it's up to you to say, look, now, I, I can't afford this. What can you do for me? Am I might get close to it. What's your best price? <clears throat> or make an offer that you think is a very fair price. But what you have to do is to, especially if you're looking at, at a used equipment, is if you're inexperienced and don't know all the things you need to look for, the best money or best time you can have is to carry somebody with you to inspect it for you and look for items that maybe will cause you trouble that because you have an inexperienced eye, you couldn't see it. So always be willing to, to get someone to go with you look at used equipment. <clears throat> now, you're going to need some startup capital to get going. And uh, the more vehicles and more trucks you try to start with, the more capital you're going to need. So... Most folks want to begin small, onesies or twosies, <clears throat> and then slowly uh, uh, add one or two vehicles at a time, usually one per year. 
Uh, see how that goes cash flow wise. See if you can hold on to your drivers uh, and hold on to your customers to grow slowly and surely. So, kind of let's just talk about getting started now. Let's say you've made the move, you've got yourself in a position to to start up to start hauling freight, <clears throat> and you want to get your name out there. One of the handouts I could offer to you, if you want it, is do's and don'ts about naming your business. Uh, do's and don'ts about naming your business. There's a lot of things to consider, <clears throat> and I'm glad to share with you a study guide on that. We don't have time to go into it tonight. Uh, one of the things I will mention is, is that I do not suggest that you put your name and your phone number uh, on the side of your truck. Uh, because there are lots of folks who are just looking for a reason to call a truck driver and tell them that uh, you broke my window or you did this or you did that. Usually you want to uh, you want to advertise and market uh, your business, uh, but do it in such a way as that it doesn't invite people to blame you for things you didn't do. <clears throat> uh, having an Internet uh, website is going to be critical for you if you're going to be serving the public or going after a new business Lots and lots of things to do considering that. And I'll tell you, <clears throat> it's not as expensive as you think it is, but the beauty of it is if you're out here on a, on a, uh, a transported truck with trailer, you've got a, a rolling billboard with you all the time. So how you use that billboard to promote your Internet websites it can be really critical, and we'll be glad to help you with that. We've got contacts, uh, members of the Academy here, your friends and neighbors, uh, who are in the vinyl letter business, in, uh, business do signs for the trucks, uh, very low price and very reasonable. If you'd like to uh, get the uh, information on them so you can talk to them about maybe helping them uh, do the signings for your truck, I'll be glad to share it with you. How about that business plan? That's right. Now, especially if you're going to need to be borrowing money or go to the, uh, an institution to ask for money uh, or even to... Uh, a, a, uh, looking for a partner or someone to fund your business, they may be requiring that you have a business plan. I'm saying that whether you are borrowing money or not, I want you to have a business plan before you get started and are making too much investment because the business plan is going to help you to avoid a lot of unexpected expenses and pitfalls. By the book, by the college book, there's seven different essential parts of a business plan. They may or may not apply to every business. As a matter of fact, those seven essential parts are essential if you're a big manufacturing company or you're going into a multi-million dollar business uh, with lots of employees. Uh, you may need to spend a lot of time on each section. But just as an independent truck operator, that is not the case. But you do need to plan. And you do need to get legal. I don't know of anyone that's going to be in the trucking business out serving the public that, number one, is not going to be on the highway, and number two, is not going to have exposure to accidents where other people uh, may uh, want to sue you for one reason or another and attack your personal assets. Uh, your personal assets can be protected somewhat by being incorporated as an LLC, <clears throat> and therefore most truckers, I don't know of any who do not, uh, have uh, have got their LLC corporation uh, established, and I think that that's a must pretty much because insurance companies almost require it these days. How do you get your LLC? Uh, that's, that's something you can do online. That's something you can do with your accountant or your attorney. You can do it yourself or with some of these uh, 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 technical assistant folks that I mentioned earlier. They can help walk you through that as well. Trucking insurance is a must. It's, a, it's, it's a, just like the lifeblood in your uh, trucking business because to, to call, haul a load for someone, they they got to have that cargo insurance. you got to protect them. Uh, if you don't borrow money for a big rig, that collateral has got to be protected with an insurance policy. Your drivers need uh, health coverage, and then you need the physical liability insurance in case you damage someone else's personal or property. Lots of insurance companies out here, but very few agents who really understand the best way to serve an independent trucker. In your community, there may or may not be a, 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 an agency that's really good at that. 
But somewhere around every 50 to 100 miles, there's a, a company that specializes in independent truckers. How do you find out where they are and who they are? Again, it's go back to the truck shops, to the truck stop, uh, friends that you may have. Ask them who's handling their insurance. Just let ask them. And number two, ask them how well their insurance carrier is doing for them and how do, you, how do they think their rates are. They, rates will vary a lot. A lot to do with how much you have to pay for your insurance. It's going to have to do with your credit score, uh, your personal reputation, uh, and uh, basically how well you are in managing risk. So uh, find an agent that you can talk to, you feel comfortable with, and it knows the trucking business, and that will help you get started in that direction. Trucking insurance uh, uh, is going to be interesting. There will be a different type of insurance and different riders for for the different things you're doing. So logging or, or, or dump trucking and such as that, your agent will be able to log into their computer, uh, list down the type of trucking that you're going to be doing, the sizes, the weights, the cargo, and automatically they can come up with, with the so their software will come up with, the type of insurance that you probably want and need. It's something that you can't hardly get without it because there's things to consider about being the primary liability, your cargo insurances, your physical damage insurance, and your accident insurance. All of these have different wrinkles depending on one, where you're operating to, uh, uh, how, how old is your equipment, and the value of it. There's an association in North Carolina, and I think probably in every other state. It's called the North Carolina Truckers Association. Uh, they're not paying me a thing, and I've never met these folks. However, I hear of them often because many independent truckers really appreciate what the Truckers Association do for them. What they do do is to offer them lots and lots of, of, of uh, webinars, seminars, uh, monthly information on things that are changing. So, as I mentioned earlier, these regulations are always changing, and the North Carolina Truckers Association is pretty much dedicated, if you belong to them, to send you notices, advance notices, on when, when things are changing. They hold workshops for folks to come and, and uh, see about better ways of things that are doing and kind of keep you on the cutting edge of what's going on in the trucking industry in North Carolina. Uh, you can go to their uh, to their website online, North Carolina Truckers Association. They do have a membership fee for different. Uh, the larger your trucking company is, the more your fees are. Uh, so you can check that out on. All right, you're ready to get started. Several of you told me you're thinking about it, but I know that probably part of what's on your mind is how about my startup investment, Steve? What can it, how much is it going to cost me? We always think about that. So there's a long list of different things that you may or may not need to spend money on. Here's just some examples of the types of expenses you would have. Take a minute and look that over. The biggest thing on there would be an insurance, right, at $8,500. Well, I stuck that on there because that could be your month, your annual premium. Uh, it, it could be that higher. It could be higher. But I, I want to mention to you that uh, depending on uh, your credit reputation and, and your situation that you're in and the insurance company you're talking to, one company might require you to pay the entire annual premium up front, where another may just say just pay 20% up front and then you pay the balance in, the, in uh, 10 months. So when you're in shopping for your insurance, Find out what the upfront costs are going to be and how much that monthly premium is going to be. That may be something that forces you to keep shopping for other for other companies. Uh, I don't want to give any definite <clears throat> premium amounts here, but I can tell you they can vary a whole lot. It can vary a whole lot. So be willing to shop and uh, negotiate all that you can with those insurance premiums. Pretty much everything else is just going to stand on its own from the price of your tags or different types of registrations, the first time you roll out filling your truck up with fuel or maybe half filling it up to keep the weight down. So those other numbers are going to be uh, straight up. 
make your list, depending on some of these may or may not apply to you. So you go ahead now and start making your list of startup investments and see how it works out. <coughs> Notice I don't have anything on this slide about the truck or the trailers. No, I like to keep those on the separate sheet because that startup investment might be a certain amount of down payment and then a certain amount per month. So, Or you may be leasing or rent to owning, so you would have a different expense module uh, for the actual truck and the trailer. So what's going to get somebody real happy in working on your business plan? Uh, uh, what's, the, what's the opportunities that's coming at you? Let's say that someone says to you, a local manufacturer or grower says, if you'll, if you'll guarantee to look after me and haul my product or, or my, uh, my agricultural products or things I'm making or bring raw materials into me, I'll guarantee you $305,000 next year because I've got a certain amount of business, I've got contracting, and I know how many miles you'll have to go, and I'll go ahead and tell you what the rate would be right now. Well, this is a good example. Is anyone talking about a guaranteed rate for over a year? It always needs to be based on a certain price per fuel uh, per gallon. Then if the gallons go up, the prices go up, these rates would go up. Of course, if the gallon price goes down, you might reduce the rates as well. But in this situation, they told, told me that uh, in January and March, I've got 30,000 miles at $2 a mile. In uh, October, I've got 25000 at $3 a mile. Now, and this was done about three years ago, so if I was doing it today, I'd, I'd raise each one of those rates by about a dollar and a half because of fuel prices and inflation. But this is just a guide. At any rate, in this guide, I was going to bring in $305,000 from this one customer, plus I would be able to, to, to use my vehicles for to make money with other people as well. So you say, man, that is a good deal. I'm just going to run out and go ahead and get me a truck right now and take advantage of this because I know that's got to be good. Don't do that. Don't do it until you see what the cost of doing that business might be. Because the good thing about this industry, you can pretty much nail down what your operating costs are going to be. And a lot of businesses, you can't do that. So that's, very, that's a good thing about trucking. So you can figure out what your driver's compensation, fuel cost, insurance, the tires, and a good idea of maintenance. Uh, you will know what your truck and your trailer uh, costs are. And when you add all those up, you're going to have what we call the CODB, or cost of doing business. When we take that and subtract it from the $305,000, we'll have an idea on what's left. That's what a business plan looks like. This is a simple business module for that one customer. But a business plan to look at an overall module with other customers, other types of vehicles and expenses, other things you might be doing. But always your business plan is aimed at telling you what's left at the end of the day. Fuel cards are a neat thing. Maybe if you hadn't been involved, you're not aware of that, but fuel cards are credit cards. But in the trucking industry, fuel cards are, are very important for a lot of reasons. If you're headed across the country uh, uh, with a load in a big truck, uh, just fuel alone is going to add up and cost you a lot of money. You know that up front. If you blow a tire or two out, that's going to cost a, another 1000 bucks. You may have some lodging expenses or some uh, personal things that you need to do. Uh, there's going to be uh, fees and way stations and, and maybe permits that you have to get. So you might have to be carrying several thousand dollars in cash just to cover your expenses to go across the country on a trip. Well, a fuel card allows you to go ahead and put that money into a card so it's secure, and as you need it, you can draw it out. Sometimes independent truckers will do this for their drivers. Lots of times load boards, when you're doing business with load boards, they will go ahead and furnish you a, a, a fuel card so you don't know, have to be using your money as you go. So it's kind of a credit line for truckers. Keeps you from having to carry so much cash around. And it's an excellent way to keep your records for record keeping because it'll keep up with your mileage, your fuel, uh, the hours you were in the seat, a lot of different things you can keep. Uh, in the fuel card uh, uh, territory. 
Regulations are something that someone in your organization is going to need to stay on top of. Either you personally, your administrative staff, your broker, uh, uh, the trucking company you're working for, someone needs to know the regulations and how to file uh, the different forms when needed, how to do audits, uh, and different things. The North Carolina Department of Transportation has an excellent, excellent uh, uh, website on commercial trucking. I uh, want to mention to you that because it's a place that you can spend a little bit of time and do a whole lot of learning. You have to know this, though, folks, and I learned this the hard way through the years. Everybody's going to learn it one way or the other. The risk that will get you down the quickest and hurt you the most in your heart is that of uh, substance abuse. Substance abuse, be it drugs or alcohol or other things, do not mix. Do not mix in the trucking business. At some point in time, it's going to knock you down. It's every time it's going to catch up with you one way or the other. So don't know you can get past this. So I'm saying it just as plain as I know how to sell it. Anyone that you bring on board, let them know that random drug testing is a must. You don't have any uh, flexibility on that. If someone balks on you and don't want random drug testing, just tell them they need to work somewhere else. They don't need to work for anybody in the trucking business because it needs to come. You cannot take a chance on losing your life investment and having to live with the guilt of you didn't do all you could to protect your family and your equipment and your uh, well-being and all the other people out there that a uh, someone under a, uh, uh, the influence of something could hurt or kill other people. <clears throat> Create a marketing plan now. You're going to get in business. Maybe you're ready to make the leap. Well, right now, let's go ahead and think about how are you going to promote and market your business. Lots of different things to do, lots of different ways to approach it. Uh, that's another good reason to get involved in our uh, our core series of, of, of uh, subjects and webinars that we'll be kicking off on April 28th to start learning these things and creating your own business savvy. The rest of the story is maybe you're just not sure about trucking yet. You know you want to start your own business. Well, these, uh, these series of uh, businesses and discussions we're going to be doing may give you some ideas on something else you feel better about. Load boards. Load boards. That's where truckers can go and see what shippers are making available for people to haul for them. The shippers are fishing for truck drivers. The, the uh, shippers are fishing for someone to make a bid on their load to go from point A to point B. The qualified uh, driver that makes the high bid uh, before cutoff time will get the business. Different companies manage load boards like Landstar, J.B. Hunt, other people. Uh, if you t well, went on the computer uh, uh, a few weeks ago, looks like I don't have the date here, uh, but at J.B. Hunt, and you were looking, and let's say that you were in the northeastern United States. You would uh, click on your computer that you were up here in one of these uh, New England states, and you were trying to pick up a load. Well, this would tell you right here that in this region, it looks like there's a, a couple of hundred loads there available uh, to pick up. Then you would type on it, <clears throat> click on each one of those individual loads. It would give you the details about what's there and what's, where is it going. And then you could submit a bid that you will offer to carry it from point A to their point B for a certain amount of money. And indeed, if you're the low bidder uh, and you're qualified, then Landstar or Hunt or whichever company is running the board <clears throat> would award you that order. Then that means you got you got the job, and then the load board would uh, tally up with you how much money that uh, you'll end up be getting because they're going to get a percentage. Uh, they ask you if you want to get a fuel card to help you from point A to point B. Now that fuel card, of course, expense would come out of your uh, money that you were going to get. Load boards are kind of cool. If you've never been on one, then I suggest you go ahead and just kind of 
uh, shop around a few of them, get, kind of get a hang for it. Uh, really interesting to look at. Now, if you indeed want to <coughs> hedge your bets for hard times, the best thing you can do is start developing your own network of shippers, people that you're not going through the load boards for, people you're not going through the brokers for, just you've got some shippers that you do business with individually, eyeball to eyeball. I like to call them the low-hanging fruit or the ripe fruit. That's people who live and operate in kind of your same area, kind of in your lane, and it's easy for you to to uh, to get to know them. Maybe it's an apple grower nearby or a boat builder or uh, someone in the, in the lumber business or the furniture business, uh, someone that uh, uh, repairs race cars. Just everything you can imagine is being hauled on trucks. And if you can develop a one-on-one -on -one relationship with folks that are shipping all the time, then you'll be able to get those business, and you will not have to share a part of your profits with a, with a broker. You'll end up making more profit or being more competitive in doing so. So finding your own personal shippers you can work with is really important. Find folks you can look at eye to, eyeball to eyeball. Uh, uh, go to them. Talk to them directly uh, when we're uh, Show them your equipment. Have a business card you can talk to them about. It's great if you have a web page you can also refer them to. But look your best. Uh, dress to impress. Uh, practice your introduction speech so, uh, when you're asking them for the business. It's a good, good thing to do. Now, some of us just need brokers. That's the kind of business I want to do. I want to drive. I don't want to worry about all this individual stuff. I want the brokers uh, to handle the paperwork for me and just send me my part of the money and uh, keep up with my paperwork at the end of the year. Uh, send me a, 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 a form, a W-2 form about or a 1099 telling me how much uh, money they had sent to me. They can make the deal for you. They can uh, uh, get their piece of the pie for their service. Uh, they know a lot of things about owner-operators that, that you can go to and find out advice. So good brokers are very special. And brokers specialize in certain types of business, and they've got their own. Every broker's got their own little family of drivers. So... How do you break into that group? Because in this business, like every other business, it's who you know sometimes and not what you know. You need to, again, talk with the local drivers in your area and find out who the brokers are that are uh, giving the most honest and most fair deals for everybody. Try to have five different types of, of loads that you can carry. Try to do more than just have one or two, but... Think about the different types of customer groups that you can serve and go ahead and start contacting uh, some of those now so that maybe you'll start getting uh, work and bid opportunities just right away. But you need to have more than one. Try to have at least five and then five different sets of potential shippers that you can work with. Let's talk about that growth plan. We'll start out here with one and then in your mind and on paper, Let's think about when you want to start adding. What what are the criteria that I need to do step by step to grow my business? A bad plan is better than no plan, so be willing to start making a plan. Now on April twenty eighth or thereabout or close to that, we'll we'll start with uh, things to consider about getting your business started. Then the following week we're going to be talking about doing a business plan. So you'd be welcome to come in with that. After that we'll have two weeks of marketing. Then we'll go into funding, then negotiating and bookkeeping and record keeping and taxes, and then how to close sales. So that would be a, a busy time. I want to invite you to join with us. Learn how to take things in and out, how to figure your expenses, your cost of doing business, uh, take it slow during the first year, get a good handle on it, and then consider whether or not you want to grow and whether or not you want to add in any debt. The risks are scary at first, there's no doubt about it, but remember, every risk has a risk management tool that you can put in place to keep that particular risk from hurting you too badly. <coughs> so, after you get your vehicle, you learn the details, you start getting some business. Okay, do you want... A new customer every time 
you do something? Do you just want to serve your customers one time? Well, I want to tell you, if every customer you ever get from now in the future is a one-time, first-time only, then you don't have a rough road to hope. Because everybody's going to be different, there'll be a lot of stress, and you're just not going to be able to do a good job. How can you have a good, steady business? Uh, learning to improve with each and every load is to have a customer base that's staying with you. People that's giving you business time after time after time, we call that repeat business. And I like to call when I'm getting repeat business because the customer wants ask for me, that is a raving fan customer. That's folks that not only want me to serve them, but also will spread the good name to other people. So 40% of the reason you will have repeat business is, is your customer service, how well you're treating your customers. But 60% of the reason people will come back to do business with you is hospitality. And hospitality is all about how do they feel about doing business with you. Do they feel like they can trust you? Do they like you? Do they want you to come back? Do they feel good about giving you product that you're sending to your to their customer? The goal, the, your goal is with every customer, when you're pulling away from their dock after you've loaded up their, their freight, you want them to be saying to themselves, this outfit, this fellow, this lady really works hard to satisfy us, and I think we can depend on them all the way. I think we can depend on them all the way. And I'm doing my best to give them all my business. Let's take a minute and have a little sip of water here. I apologize for cut, for uh, covering so many subjects so fast, but there's just so much to consider that as have you here this first time because we can come back with other webinars and seminars, or you can just ask individual questions on certain subjects, and we'll be glad to to spend as much time as you'd like. Plus, your handouts have a lot more information in them than what's uh, uh, on the slides. So if I have your email address, it looks like most of you have given it to me, uh, I'll be able to email you a, another set of handouts and these uh, practice tests and a video of, of our presentation today. That way you can watch the video and stop it any time you want to, look at the slide because that's the main thing on the video screen, and review any of these things, have any questions, make notes that might help your business. It's mighty easy to talk about I don't be a truck driver and drive around North Carolina right here where I know all the landmarks. I mean, I can drive from Wilmington to, uh, to Asheville right now without any problems. I already know the roads and pretty much uh, where the turnoffs are, where the big truck stops are. That's uh, not scary at all to operate in North Carolina. But so many drivers have told me after they've gone through the academy and got their whole business started, you know, Steve, what we didn't realize is how scary it is every time you cross the border. Every time we cross the border, we know things are going to get kind of shaky. And why is that? That's because every state has their own regulations again, right? Every state has bridges and roads to different uh, regs that apply. Uh, some states and, and some areas you're going to be driving to have awful roads or Places that tend to get clogged up with with uh, uh, roadblocks or, or construction all the time or, or wrecks all the time. So, crossing borders, we got a little special thing in here, just a kind of chance to think about that. When we cross that state line, we just know that we're in for uh, way stations, in for folks with uh, with uh, these portable scales, different ways to slow you down. Uh, uh, personalities sometimes that are just as nice as they can be, and then personalities that are exact opposite of folks you hope you never have to see again. But it's a new beginning. You cross that border, there's always something new to deal with, and here we go having to do it, uh, and standing outside or watching somebody uh, uh, put the portable scales on you can be really scary at times, and they know, sure know how to do it, don't they? 
And the biggest, uh, what we don't want to do when we cross the border is end up in a, in a traffic jam that looks like this. And it seems to be more and more of them all the time. Uh, the good news is that as uh, winter weather goes away, maybe we won't have as many. But uh, you just don't ever know when an accident happens that as much road construction as we have, that's, that's enough to jam up the roads too. But uh, across those borders, you need to be able to be in touch with someone on your radio or on your computer, some way or another, stay in touch with software that will help you avoid as many traffic jams and uh, road problems and low bridge site work uh, as we possibly can. Now this is a this is a sad day. I don't know if many of you have ever had a chance, like in this slide, to, to get stuck up under a bridge. Uh, I have. I, I had a for, I was hauling a forklift one day up in the Wilson area, and I went under a bridge, and the forklift was too high, and it it didn't tear the bridge up, but it sure tore the forklift up and made my truck jump up on the front end, so the the front end was not uh, wheels weren't on the ground. I was glad when the forklift came out from under the bridge and the front end of the truck fell down that my wheels were still straight because I was in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic on Highway 301. So bridges always have had my attention. And, and I know that if I was going in a lot of different states, knowing that there's so many low bridges that might be up there ahead of you, you just got to stay on your P's and Q's to avoid problems. So crossing broke borders, some folks say, makes everything kind of weird. So it's a, let's make a, a, a short list of hot issues when you cross the borders. Uh, keep up with these as, as you get started in your business. So save this handout. And when you start crossing borders, certain checklists you need to look over. Everything from your flashlights and your bulbs all the way to making sure you, your fuel cap is locked. Uh, know the state laws about what's going on that are different than the states you just left. Uh, know where those low bridges are, low weight limits. Uh, just lots of different things that are very, very important. Uh, what are the DOT requirements in the area where you're working at? It may be totally different from the state you just left. Uh, major highways and secondary roads, how about those weight lift limits? Does it make a difference? Which always makes me ask how much fuel do I want to put on the truck? Uh, maybe I do not want to fill up here because it'll make me weigh so much more and maybe get me in trouble with with, uh, with some scales or doing damage to roads. Uh, know, where, know what your fuel, fuel prices are. If you're traveling up the East Coast and uh, the difference in what you pay in Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, and Virginia could vary as much as 50 cent uh, per gallon and depending on which state you fill up in. So, uh, Keeping your costs down and how much fuel you add at point to point, it's all about when you're crossing borders, try to get the information in advance of where you're headed. Got to have those rest stops, right, from time to time. Got to have a place to pull over, maybe the right truck stops. Keep an idea when you're crossing borders uh, where the next place is that you plan to stop. Uh, talk to your fellow truckers. Uh, Talk with the people on the load boards, lots of places you can find to get good advice about that. Uh, listen up now to computers now, uh, especially your highway softwares. More and more states are offering software to tell you uh, all the time uh, where there's major truck uh, traffic jams uh, on the interstates or major highways. So that may be part of the technology you want to add to your truck or laptop. One person said the safest thing to do is, is that when you're traveling at night and you're changing lanes and you're kind of nervous in, in, in big things, this little footnote that one driver told me was, I'm always looking at that last light on my trailer, on my 18-wheeler trailer. I'm always looking at that last light to make sure when I'm changing lanes and pulling back into the lane after making a pass that I'm not going to cut someone off and they got plenty of room. And they say they've learned to focus on that last light uh, to let them know when it's safe to pull in and out. Uh, have a good idea and write it down. Just don't guess at it. Write down the trailer number and your tag numbers on your equipment. Uh, you don't know when you, uh, you might be in a place that someone has stolen it from you or you have an accident that you need that number. Uh, sometimes they're hard to find. So just know that's part of what you want to carry around in your billfold or on person or have a, a 
written, these numbers written down when you need them, you'll be able to pick them up. And if you're picking up something for a refrigerated tra a trailer, make sure that you pre-cool it before you get there. That's going to save you time in loading the uh, product on, or it may save uh, quality on what you're carrying. So just a good remembrance thing is pre-cool uh, that refrigerated trailer, have it ready to load when you get there, and that may save you a lot of uh, a lot of time. When you're shopping to buy something, because there's been so many floods in uh, in America and around, always know how to look for rust. Look for rust as an indicator that the vehicle you're shopping for has been involved in a flood. More and more drivers are telling me that they they're hearing about uh, products that are offered on the market. Uh, that have a lot of flood damage to them, and therefore it's a, it's a problem, and the titles don't show that. Of course, the titles are supposed to show it, I know, but that doesn't mean it does. So, again, if you're shopping for equipment and you don't have the expertise to really give a good inspection, is you find someone to go with you and help you inspect. <coughs> and, hey, it gets right back to the basics, as we said in slide one. Always keeping in our mind that if we're not bringing the load back, that means we're going to be traveling empty without pay, and that is a bad thing. So in the back of our mind, as independent truckers all the time, we're figuring out where is that load I can bring back and make sure my business stays profitable. Conquering the competition, and there's so much of it out there, the main competition is not all of our other driver friends. The main competition is ourselves. Uh, the the strategies and the and the uh, distractions that we have in our whole life have a lot to do with what what our competition is. <coughs> Excuse me. Setting the correct priorities and maintaining the high standards will help you beat the competition faster than anything else. Most of you guys, most of you ladies, are all about doing that. And I'm going to mention right now, because even this afternoon we have uh, as many ladies as we do gentlemen uh, on board, more and more uh, uh, ladies are becoming involved in the transportation industry. And you know why? They do really well, usually because they, they, they maintain higher standards and they're willing to set the priorities to make it happen. So keep that in mind. As long as you're doing that, you'll probably make less mistakes and make more money. Present yourself professionally, <clears throat> good-looking rig, good-looking clothes, smile on your face. You have practiced your introductions so that when you're meeting folks, you're going to start personal relationships, uh, businesses that will encourage them to call you back. You don't have to have new equipment, but you should have clean equipment. And mainly you should have equipment that, that does not leak and mess up people's driveways. Uh, you want equipment that's safe to be around and that you are proud of. Again, it don't have to be brand new, but it can look really good, and that'll make a difference in whether people want you to haul their product. Listen, I was a retail tractor dealership operation, and I sent expensive tractors all over the United States to customers that I had never met myself. And the only relationship they had with my company was with me on the phone or maybe on the computer, but was, was with the driver who delivered the equipment that they had purchased. So I tried to pick the drivers that I knew were good to my customers, that went the extra mile to make them feel good about doing business with me, and I paid them more money, and I gave them tips and bonuses. So if you're in a type of business and caring for customers that you can develop that relationship, here's what happens. First of all, that shipper will request you every time. Second of all, they may just call you directly, and you'll make more money because you didn't have to go through an agent. Thirdly, the customers on the other end, <coughs> if you've made that good relationship, they'll remember you as well. They will become raving fan customers and send business your way. How do you do that? You have business cards. You have brochures. You have a website so that you can easily be found when it's time to do things. Also, on the side of your trucks, you are a, a traveling billboard. And depending on what you're doing, uh, you can use these uh, uh, truck trailers 
uh, to send a lot of business your way, especially now as I go back to connecting the dots with our earlier conversation. If you've got some products that you're buying and selling and retailing or wholesaling, you can promote those on the side of your truck while you're hauling other people's freight. Absolutely. It's a good thing to do. Or maybe even you can find someone that just wants you to advertise their products on the side of your truck, and you can ask to create an, an extra monthly income uh, just by using your trailer as an advertising billboard. What do you want to do? You want to light, let your light shine. Uh, I'm proud to be in small business and to work with folks just like you. Uh, yeah, it's it's the sometimes it seems like the same old, same old, but you know what? We're all on the journey. We're going to a better place, and we're trying to do better for your families, uh, to have a better life, to set your own legacy and such as that. Be proud of yourself. Thank you for what you're doing. But if you're letting your light shine and you're smiling at folks and you're inviting them to create business relationships, I'll tell you that things will go a lot better. Because if you're doing the best you can be to be the best person you can be, then you're going to be the best business person you can be. When you're lighting yourself, when you're letting yourself shine, uh, not only are you helping other people, but you're helping yourself. And it just goes a long, long way 